astronomer, and we are here with our trusted astronomer, just a few offices away from me uh, on the unceded territory, a beautiful day on the unceded territory, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and that is our astronomer, Marley. Hey, Marley, how's it going? Hi, Michael. You could say we're two offices away, exactly, <laughs> in this hallway. Yeah. Oh, no, not again. Michael's left. Okay. So this happens from time to time. I guess today I'll take the lead till he returns. But uh, today, nice day, sunny. But what I want to talk about mostly today was the lack of a launch that happened. Oh, thank goodness he's back. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <laughs> my life just, oh, <laughs> okay. You know, like Zoom, you know, sometimes there's so many buttons and then all of a sudden you click the close button. It's, oh, it's how life goes. The app. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I quit. I'm out of here. Uh, there is couldn't possibly be any uh, news stories to talk about today, but we've got some big news stories. Of course, there was some big news stories uh, this past weekend, um, non news stories, but actual big news stories in the scope of things. But uh, some really exciting news stories from another mission. So we're going to talk about two missions today, primarily. Let's start off with the mission that didn't happen, a very big mission for NASA, for the Canadian Space Agency, and that is Artemis. Uh, was supposed to launch on August 28th, I believe. It was supposed to launch um, a few days later. Did not happen. Marley, what happened? Yes. So it was supposed to launch Monday, August 29th, actually, one day before, early, early in the morning, though. So you're forgiven. It was like supposed to launch at 530 okay, Monday right. morning. Uh, so uh, many things happened to prevent this launch. So first, we had a lot of weather delays. So lightning risks around the launch pad, which is very bad. You don't want lightning to strike the rocket. Uh, and so that delayed them even beginning fueling. They won't fuel until uh, they're beneath a certain amount of chance of a lightning strike within like five nautical miles of the launch pad down there in Florida. So then they were able to finally start launching and uh, or fueling. And then they encountered a possible liquid hydrogen leak in what's called the tail service mast umbilical on the core stage. So what that refers to is the rocket itself sits in what's called a mobile launcher. So it's a essentially a mobile launch pad. They can move it to and from the launch pad. It sits in there and attached to it are all these arms with a bunch of uh, fuel lines and different uh, will look like snakes, but are really umbilicals is what they call them. They're these giant cords that attach to the rocket and pump the fuel through, take things out, things like that. And so in the tail service mast umbilicals that was kind of behind the rocket where we couldn't really see uh, where the live stream was, uh, there appeared to be a leak there. Uh, so they were paused for a minute to take a look at it, but then ultimately continued fueling. It appeared to fix itself and stabilize itself. What really... Uh, resulted in the scrub on the Monday was an engine problem. So what they do with the engines is they have to uh, what's called bleed the engines or thermally condition them. The fuel is very, very cold. It's liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. And to get it that cold, you're at about a temperature of like in the negative 250s, negative 300 Celsius. So Whoa. it's very, very cold. It's cryogenically cooled. It's very, very cold. And so what they want is the engine to already be accustomed to that temperature. So it doesn't shock the system or cause a rapid state change of the liquid hydrogen or oxygen, something very cold, encountering something very hot, uh, it would revert back to gas and you could potentially have an explosion in your engine. And we definitely don't want that. So they bleed them. They let a little bit of fuel run through to get it accustomed to how cold it is, you know, keep them primed for the fuel that will eventually come. Uh, engine three was not reaching it, uh, that temperature range for whatever reason. They determined that it was unlikely due to be from the engine itself and actually because of a valve further up in some of the connecting mechanisms between the engine and the fuel line. So ultimately, they just ran out of time. So they could fix this on the launch pad or troubleshoot this on the launch pad, they, but their launch window was closing and it would have taken them longer than the amount of time they had left. So they just ultimately decided to scrub the launch and try again a different day. So we're talking about liquid hydrogen, which I can imagine not a lot of people use in their day-to-day -day life. We're extremely cold temperatures here. Why do they use liquid hydrogen? It seems like it's a very um, finicky um, fuel to be using, um, given that it needs to be that cold. Um, why do they use it for these rockets? Uh, for this one, there's multiple reasons why people might choose to use liquid hydrogen and a liquid oxygen mixture in terms of rocket launches, but it is very light 
uh, in, as terms of, you know, as fuels go, it's a very light fuel. And while being very light, it's also extremely powerful. It lets out a lot of energy when you burn it, which is what we want. We want a lot of energy coming out to push our rocket up. Um, and it has, you know, an extreme burn intensity is what it has. And when you combine that with an oxidizer or the thing that actually helps a burn with the chemical reaction, like liquid oxygen, you have what's called the highest, uh, specific impulse, which is like the highest amount of energy per small thing pushing out of the rocket. So to lift something like the SLS, you would want something that's light enough, right? Cause you don't want to put even more weight on top of something that's already so large and has so much mass, but you want that to also be able to push out a lot of energy. So liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen combination ends up being the best bet. Okay. But not all rockets use liquid hydrogen, right? No, no. Like the, the SpaceX, the Falcon 9 rockets, they use liquid oxygen and rocket grade kerosene. Okay. Interesting. Now I can imagine um, as we're watching launches off the pad, and especially I can remember uh, watching video of Apollo and you kind of see sort of like the you know, kind of like that, almost like steam coming out, but it's obviously, it's not steam coming out. It's that liquid hydrogen kind of like leaking out of the edge of the rocket. Is that what we're seeing? Oh, when they're fueling it? Yeah, you'll yeah. get like some of it coming off and, you know, you know, it also makes the rocket very cold. And so then when the outside air hits the rocket, it condenses. And so you get water droplets on it and then that steams up as the rocket gets hot. Yeah, there's lots of different things happening uh, on it. But when the rocket itself launches and the rockets that use liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen as propellants, when it launches, you get that big cloud out of the bottom of the rocket. Yeah. That's um, superheated water vapor coming out. So it's just water, right. uh, which is the um, result of that reaction. But I could, there's also that famous video of a video right close, close next to uh, the Apollo rocket. And it was all this ice kind of like falling off of like the <laughs> sides of the rocket. Is that because like the outside of the rocket um, had ice kind of like build up and then it's just kind of like all falling off as the rocket is taking off? Yeah, it gets very, very cold, right? It's metal, right? And you have something very, very cold inside. And so the outside air as it hits kind of like when you have condensation on your cup. Yeah. It's like that. Just, instead of taking it from a gas to a liquid, it takes it from a gas right to ice, right into a solid. So it's very, very cold. cool. Super cold. <laughs> so that was that. That was the first one. What about the second failure? Uh, well, I, I'm, don't call it a failure. They didn't <laughs> fail. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the second no yet. go. The second, the no, second go. no go. So this was actually a lot more interesting and made me laugh a lot. So um, Saturday, September 3rd, this was the date they, the next possible date they could have done it. Uh, so you get at 4.09 AM Pacific time, they start to load the engine. They get the go ahead to load the engines with fuel. They had good weather, like a 60% good weather thing. It was very good that we weren't being delayed by weather as much as last time. And then at 4.24, they discover a liquid hydrogen leak again in a quick disconnect cavity. This liquid hydrogen leak is in a different spot from last time. So it's not in the service tail mass umbilical. It's in what's called a quick a uh, quick disconnect in the core stage. So they are in a different spot in the rocket now having a liquid hydrogen leak. So how they choose to deal with this is in the quick disconnect cavity, what that is, it's like something goes over top uh, and holds on. And when the super cool fuel runs through it, it shrinks and creates a really, really tight seal as the cold run, the cold fuel runs through. So their solution is to warm up this quick disconnect seal uh, and then rerun fuel through it, cold fuel through it to shrink it back down and hopefully kind of reseed it, have it move the way it needs to move to give a tight seal. So they do this, they resume filling at 5.09 AM and then at 5.53, the liquid hydrogen <laughs> leak reoccurs. So now the problem hasn't fixed itself. So the first solution didn't work. So their second solution is to close the valve completely. So close uh, where the fuel is coming from. Uh, and then on the opposite side, drain it. So drain all the fuel out and then increase pressure because there's pressure also comes into play uh, in terms of very cold fuels and loading stuff. And there's lots happening, but basically they just want to increase the pressure, have it open up again, run the fuel through, close, make it tight. Uh, that doesn't work. You at 623, you refill it. And at, uh, sorry, that should not be 936. That should be a different time. That should be 636 you get the leak reoccurring. So the leak starts again. All the times were in Eastern and I had to convert them to Pacific. I always miss one. Um, the leak reoccurs at 9.36 a.m. So they take a while to figure out what are we going to do about it. They end up doing their first solution uh, again. They decide to warm it up again because maybe it'll work this time. Uh, and then they resume filling it at 
18 a.m. And then at 728, you get the best headline ever, which is liquid hydrogen leak detected once again. So <laughs> did not work. Nothing they did work. Uh, and so they start discussing next steps. They can't get it to work. And ultimately, they end up scrubbing the launch because they can't get this leak to stop or to settle itself down. So uh, they tried to reseed it with the heat, warming it up and bring it back down, try to reseed it by pressurizing it. That did not work. And so they just, you know, were like, OK, it's not going to work. We'll stop now. So that was the that's what caused the second scrub attempt. Right. So it's good that you uh, corrected me in reframing this as not as a failure, <laughs> but that the scrubs are part of the testing process, which I think can be a bit frustrating from uh, a bystander point of view, because you have something scheduled and you're like, OK, it's scheduled. Something's going to happen. But really, in these early stages, and especially with a brand new rocket that has not launched yet, uh, all of these um launch windows are further tests, right? Um, because you do not want that worst case scenario. That would be very, very bad. So they're not going to launch until they're absolutely certain um, that it's going to go, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I watched the press conference after the August 29th scrub and one, one reporter asked if setting up on September 3rd uh, or whenever they're launch, yeah, September 3rd was just going to be essentially a very fancy fourth wet dress rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And one of the mission management team members or leads was just like, no, every time we bring that thing onto the launch pad, we fully intend to launch it. Like every time mm -hmm. there's a launch date, they're going into it with the idea at the end of it, they will launch this rocket, but they won't do that until they're 100% sure that it'll go up and the problems won't be catastrophic problems in the end. Right. So it's not, essentially another test. They're going through all of the things they need to do to ensure a successful launch. And if one of those things goes wrong, then they're just not going to take that chance. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, what's going to happen now? So it's been scrubbed a couple of times. Uh, yeah. Obviously, there is a problem that yeah. needs fixing and just refueling and hoping it goes away is not a solution. That's <laughs> not how rocket science works. So what are they going to do now? So yeah, what now? Uh, they are foregoing any launches in early September. So it will not launch at all early September. They are replacing the seal on the quick disconnect where that leak is occurring. They're fully replacing the seal that's there with the new one, but they're doing this on the launch pad. So sometimes when rockets need, go wrong, and you need to service them. They get rolled back out to the vehicle assembly building or their hangar and they do the repairs there. But instead, they're doing the repairs on the launch pad, which I found particularly interesting. I thought that they would bring it all the way back to the hangar to conduct the repair, because when they do a repair on the launch pad, they actually have to do like set up basically a base around the rocket uh, mm. and protect it from any adverse weather. So like rain, extreme heat, extreme cold, stuff like that to protect the insides of the rocket from this outside weather, which is why in the vehicle assembly building, that's like what it's for. It's built there to protect the rocket from the weather outside. And so doing it on the launch pad, I found very interesting, but that's what they're going to do. And so they could launch on September 23rd, but a lot needs to be done. They need to fix the leak and they also need to get a waiver from the United States Space Force, which refers to the need to check the batteries note uh, I have here on the bottom. So on board the space launch system, there is something called a flight termination system. And what this is, is an onboard computer that is designed to destroy the rocket if it veers off course. Like Michael and I, we were talking before, and you're like, what if it goes towards a city? And I was like, they <laughs> blow it up. Like They don't let that happen. So that's what the flight termination system is for. And that uh, the Sp U.S. Space Force requires them to check the batteries on the flight termination system every 25 days. And to do this, the whole rocket and the mobile launch sister system uh, gets moved back to the vehicle assembly building, the hangar that the rocket lives in. And so if they end up having, if they don't get that waiver, which extends the time they need to check the batteries past the 25 days, the rocket will have to wheel all the way back to the assembly building They'll have to test the batteries and then be wheeled all the way back to the launch location, which would push us back into October. So mm. it's really kind of up in the air, kind of hinges on them fixing this leak and also that waiver from the U.S. Space Force. Yeah, and it's kind of uh, interesting just optically because wheeling it back to the assembly is not like a small task. It's a big deal because this is a giant rocket, right? Um, but that's interesting because there's 
it's kind of exposed out there with all of like the weather conditions that, as you said before, there was lightning. Uh, wouldn't, that wouldn't be great if, uh, if lightning struck the, uh, the launch pad. Um, yeah. But it's such a giant rocket. It's hard to fathom. Like you've got a picture here um, showing it next to the assembly building, but it's, uh, it's miles away from, from that assembly building. It is. And it moves like at point something miles per hour. Like it's very, very slow. Like moving it to where it needs to be is an event in and of itself. Like (laughs) it is a huge deal when they, whenever they move it. Um, So I understand partially why they didn't move it. Like if they don't have to move it better to have it just uh, where it needs to be. But also I'm like, if you're gonna have to change the batteries anyway, just move the whole thing and fix it there. So we'll see what happens. Okay, so fingers crossed Artemis is going to, hopefully going to launch uh, later this month. And if not, we'll just keep waiting till it does. And when it does, we will be ready. Uh, we hopefully will have some full-blown video uh, to put into our shows. Almost all of our shows are kind of related to Artemis. You know, we've got shows about uh, humans in space. That's related to it. We've got shows about how rockets work. That's related to it. And of course, our planetarium shows. So lots of content. We'll be talking about this mission uh, for a long time. But I Another mission that we have been really excited about, I know we and you have both been excited about uh, DART, which is the double asteroid redirect. Um, Really cool mission. And we've got a first image. I didn't even realize that we were going to get an image this soon, but we've got one. either, but we did. It was very exciting. So this is a very, very small, the tiny, tiny, tiny speck uh, in this enlarged uh, image here is the asteroid uh, Didymos, which I can never never know if I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, that is the asteroid uh, system that DART is on its way to. So the double asteroid redirection test, uh, that for those that don't know, includes this asteroid Didymos and its little asteroid moonlit uh, Dimorphos. So Dimorphos orbits Didymos around. And what DART will do is it will launch itself and hit Dimorphos and try to knock it into a new orbit. And it's doing this to test whether or not this is something we could even do. Asteroid redirection as a form of planetary defense, like launching something and knocking something out of the way. So we're testing that on this little asteroid system here. And that was the first picture we got of the system, which was very, yeah, I didn't know. I didn't even know how to, I knew how to camera because it's going to take video as it goes, but I didn't know that we would get an image of it. And in fact, they weren't even sure that they had gotten an image of it when they took this picture. I think this is something like 340 something individual frames stacked on top and only them were they able to see it as the brightness uh, came through. So they were also equally as excited about this. Oh, sorry, it's 243 individual images uh, all stacked on top of each other taken on July 27th. So this is from a while ago and it was only released September 7th. And it shows them both as a single point of light. But in reality, there's one asteroid and then a little asteroid moonlit orbiting around it. Uh, The spacecraft is still 32 million kilometers away from the system as of when this photo was taken, uh, but it should uh, impact in and around uh, September 26th is when it should uh, perform the collision. Okay, so we're, we're coming up to it uh, later, later this month. Uh, so a couple of big uh, news stories. If you are watching on YouTube, please uh, drop a question about any of those two missions that we just talked about or anything else uh, that you would like to ask. Uh, we've got a few more minutes in the show. Uh, so Marley, we've got uh, Dart coming up and we've also got a big event um, later, well, this weekend um, is a big event uh, for the Chinese community because it is the Mid-Autumn Moon Festival. Um, so this is gonna be really exciting. Tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about the culture and the science of the moon. There's actually a few tickets left uh, for our event. Uh, if you wanna come on site uh, tomorrow night, we will have some moon cakes. Uh, Marley, have you ever had moon cakes before? I don't believe I have, no. Um, they are very delicious. They're they are very dense uh, and go really well uh, with tea, which will also be serving some uh, Chinese green tea tomorrow night. Uh, but you'll be uh, in the planetarium with the Chinese Canadian Museum uh, talking about the culture of the moon. So when you look up at the moon, many different cultures have, have uh, seen different shapes based on, you know, the, the maria, the dark parts contrasting with the, with the lighter parts of the moon. So it's going to be really interesting to hear a couple of those um, folk tales um, and told uh, through the Chinese perspective. Uh, Did you ever look at the moon and see any shapes when you were young? 
Uh, no, I have really, <laughs> really big trouble with that. Actually, I don't I have a very hard time recognizing uh, <laughs> shapes in anything. Like finding a constellation is very hard based on its shape. I can I know what the Big Dipper looks like. I know what the Little Dipper looks like. I can find Orion's belt and one looks like a W. And that's the extent of my ability <laughs> to find them. Uh, shapes in the moon. Yeah, was always very hard for me to see as a kid. Uh, but many in like preparing for the presentation on Friday, I've been able to, you know, kind of see how people can see them. I have to see the outline to be able to find. But I've <laughs> learned that there's in the Western cultures, we typically see like the man on the moon yeah. uh, and in East Asian cultures and also uh, in some countries in South America, they see a rabbit uh, in the same lunar Maria. Right. Uh, additionally, different things that have been seen in the highlands and lowlands of the moon are a tree, a woman and a pair of hands. So it really is interesting how the brain will just fill in uh, information where we want to see something. And it's typically of something of importance to us or, or already ties back to a story that we already have um, or in our own local folklores. Yeah, I think I've always kind of seen a poodle in the moon and that might've been because I grew up, I didn't grow up with a poodle, but with a small Bichon Frise and maybe I just associated a small white dog um, <laughs> in, the, in, the in, the, in the moon. Uh, but what's also interesting about just the, shape of the moon and the side that we see those maria are really only on that side of the moon and on the other side of the moon the side that we don't see the far side of the moon not the dark side of the moon uh that's actually where the chinese um space agency have landed they're the only spacecraft that's ever uh gone to that side is on the other side where there isn't a whole lot of maria locations there right yeah, no, that is the far side of the moon is typically the side that we see a lot of the cratering on. So lots of debris hitting that side of the moon as opposed to hitting uh, the side that faces us all the time. The side that faces us has that brilliant, you know, Lunar Maria and the sea, uh, the highlands and lowlands kind of seascape, even though they're not seas at all. Um, and we're not too sure why that happened. It may have to do with uh, how the moon is locked uh, to Earth. So one side faces us the whole time, leaving the other side more... Uh, barren to asteroid impacts and things like that. But it may also have to do with how the moon was formed in the, and how the periods of time went through the moon. The lunar Maria are associated with a lot of like volcanism and volcanic activity. So it's interesting that that doesn't surprise me as much because volcanoes aren't in all the same spots all the time. You may have one side where more volcanoes are more concentrated and one side where they're not. But it is still interesting how different the two sides look from each other. Yeah. Uh, very cool. Uh, we actually did get a question. So if you got a question in YouTube, uh, please put it in. If you're watching on Telesoptic, please come into YouTube next time to ask questions. So uh, Harry's wondering about Artemis and he found a quote kind of describing Artemis, uh, commercial and international partners uh, establishing the first long-term presence on the moon. So based on that, what are those long-term plans and goals on the moon? That has a lot to do with the larger Moon to Mars initiative. So that is when uh, like NASA's whole plan to start with us uh, establishing a long-term presence on the Moon and then moving on to exploring Mars. And it's a better idea to explore the Moon first and test our technology that someplace that's only four days away than doing that with someplace that's nine months away. So the long-term human presence on the Moon is going to be located in the lunar South Pole. I think you talked about that last week or some week ago when I was away, mm -hmm. uh, they have found lots of, well, not lots of, but signs of water ice in the South Pole of the moon. And so uh, that being there uh, raised a lot of questions. We didn't know it was there before during the Apollo missions. It's a relatively recent discovery. And so looking at that water ice in the moon, wanting to know how much it is there. And if it's in the lower, if it's in the first few millimeters of the lunar surface, that provides a source for resource extraction. So that would be starting a long-term experiment, extracting the resources of that, of the water from the moon, and also setting up a lunar base at that location to continue that science and to make it easier. Uh, but that's also like a scientific justific justification for it. There's also the fact that doing it on the moon uh, provides us as a template for doing it on Mars. So when we eventually put people on Mars, we will already have tested the technologies, tested the methods that need to be done on a landscape closer to Earth that we can then apply to somewhere so far away. Right. And this is actually um, a big deal in terms of, uh, of those long-term goals heading to Mars because there was a lot of debate actually within NASA 
where that next step was going to be. And sometimes when there's regime changes um, politically <laughs> within <laughs> NASA, sometimes these goals change. Like with any organization, you get a new boss and the, the new boss gets to set the direction. But it's a little different with NASA because money gets allocated long before these people get in there. And mm -hmm. there's Congress people that are involved and in, there's lots of jobs at stake, you know, within this um, building of infrastructure. Um, and I remember hearing about this debate of moon or Mars, like where should the focus be? Uh, it certainly seems now that everyone's focused on the moon. Like this is where we should be going next to establish this as the, as a long-term um, presence on the moon, uh, perhaps because it's more realistic um, and maybe that's the right decision. It's also like the first step. Like if we wanted to do anything further out, it would be unwise to do it when the moon is right there, in my opinion. Like the moon is right there to test technology on. Uh, why, why go further than we need to, to test it? Right. Um, one more question from Pride uh, before we end off. Uh, Hi, Pride. Would would the Earth's gravity have affected the direction of volcano formation and lava flow? Uh, and I'm Ooh. thinking that she's talking about the Earth's volcano formation, but she could also be talking about... No, I think she's talking about the moons. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's really interesting. That's a good question. Not much is known about how the moon's core or early geology worked because it's been so cold and kind of dead for so long, right? Since we've really been studying it so i don't know exactly what how the earth would have impacted the lunar um volcano formation i think because what how i'm interpreting your question is that knowing uh how the moon affects earth's tides with that pulling mm. and stretching of the water uh on the on the earth's surface would the earth then do the same to any liquid on the moon's surface and that's a very good question um i feel like yes it would possibly do something with that while there it be you know producing tides the same way that the moon produces tides here but mm -hmm. i don't know if that would in impact volcanic formation I, I don't know that's a very good question yeah i suppose that there is probably some other things to consider that we don't really know of yet until we do establish like a longer presence and be able to look at the things that are happening on the moon until we get there and are able to study the moon kind of like more up close than we have. Like we have orbiters around the moon studying um, the geologic features, but perhaps there's something that we're not thinking of that the earth affects on the moon. Yeah, there's probably a lot we're not thinking of actually. That's the same reason like in Apollo, there's probably a lot that they weren't thinking of that we are now able to look at with advancements in technology. But I guess I would say you'd have to look at a lot of moon rocks to try to figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> well, they certainly will have uh, a chance to look at a lot of moon rocks when they do get there. Uh, and hopefully we will with this first uh, step, Artemis launching, uh, hopefully later this month. Uh, stay tuned. Um, for the future uh, Ask Astronomy episodes, we'll, we'll get into it as long as as well as all of the other missions uh, that are upcoming, including DART. Maybe we'll give a DART update because we will be live back on YouTube on September the 22nd. Uh, so please join us here and uh, please bring your friends. Uh, we get, we're back in the school season. So if you're a teacher out there, uh, you can join on in and your kids can ask questions. We are here every second Thursday on YouTube. Uh, and like I said, we've got some, lots of events coming up, including, I didn't mention a movie screening on September the 22nd. We'll be screening a really cool documentary called Star Stuff, uh, which is going to uh, look at three different observatories around the world and the indigenous communities that live around those observatories and how they also have a culture of looking up at the stars. So it's gonna be a really cool documentary telling those stories of those observatories and the people that live around them. That's gonna be on September the 22nd. We're gonna be screening in the planetarium and then doing a live Q and A with a director from Italy. So uh, check our website, spacecenter.ca to get tickets and we will see you again next time.